Hi, Brian. <laughs> Are you guys ready? You ready? Going to Look at them rolling in. <laughs> Give us a second for everyone to come in. I think this camera's on, so apologies. We'll do this camera and see if I can get some reaction. <laughs> there you go. That did it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the colloquium. And so for those of you who don't know, um, I owe a deep debt of gratitude to Brett Frischman uh, today, mostly because of him introducing me and so many others to the Knowledge Commons, which is nothing like pressure, right? And we apologize for being a bit late. We're actually in a Knowledge Commons workshop, which is why Brett and Todd are here. But then we're fortunate uh, to have them also being spe speaking today at the colloquium. Um, I'm going to try to log in. I guess. I will try to log in too. Um, so hello, everyone who's here and welcome. I will moderate as always. I'm probably going to have to step out of the room for a second to be sure Brett, can, um, Brett and Todd can um, do their slideshow because of where it's at. Did you load them on here? <clears throat> on there? It's on the workshop. So it is it. on the workshop. Okay, so you can yeah. just load them there. That's yep, fine. Well, I'll go step out and do that, and I'll turn it over uh, to you to do more formal introductions, and then I'll double check that we can broadcast those. Okay, so you're getting right. the slides. Yes. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to be able to use that for the slides at some point. <laughs> yeah, once they get it set up. All right, cool. Uh, hey, everybody. <laughs> Sorry for the late start, the confusion. Um, you know, Zoom is always always an issue. Uh, so um, I'm Brett Frischman. I'm at uh, Villanova uh, with my co-author Todd Agard. Um, say hello, Todd. Todd Agard. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're uh, we're thrilled to be here to talk to you about uh, this draft chap, this draft paper that we're working on. Uh, a, a draft, I think, that will hopefully be late, lead more. So we'll write this as a chapter for the Environmental Knowledge Commons uh, book. Um, and we'll also hopefully turn it into, I think it'll sort of be the start of a, a, a other work that we, we'd like to do, a bigger a bigger project. Um, so I'm so love just looking behind to see if we're up there yet. So the title is uh, in Environment. Well, in, in, inexorably entangled mm -hmm. environmental and knowledge commons. Try to say that five times fast. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, the idea for this project. So we've been we've been so Todd and I work together at Villanova. Todd teaches environmental law, energy law, those kinds of things. I teach sort of internet law, privacy law. Um, uh, we've been talking a bunch about the idea that sort of this the, the basic premise of this paper is that in every uh, and that's that's actually something I feel like I've said here before at the workshop and oh. past workshops for like the last twenty years I've been coming here. Um, like every environmental commons has a corresponding knowledge commons. There's always sort of a co knowledge commons layer uh, that's going to exist for any environmental commons we want to think of. And so I remember being here at one point, maybe it was a dozen, 20 years ago, it was a while ago, talking about like, wouldn't it be cool to sort of do a meta-analysis of all the past natural resource commons case studies and try to uh, look at the knowledge commons that were implicit in most of those case studies, because I bet you they were there. And I bet they were actually important and relevant to the functioning of those environmental or natural resource commons, um, but we often didn't pay a whole lot of attention to them. Um, and so I've been saying that for years and never really sort of done anything with that idea other than sort of have it in the back of my head uh, until uh, we've got this environmental knowledge commons conference and book that we're sort of working on. And I said, this is a perfect opportunity to sort of explore the idea. So in contrast to some of the uh, other talks we've been hearing about this morning, um, this is sort of a, a, con a conceptual yep. theory sort of style paper uh, that can hopefully frame some of the other ones. So, okay, there we go. We're up. We're up. Uh, I love how Todd uh, entered. <laughs> Mingled environment. I only contribute. Knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Todd helped with the slides. Got the good, interesting color scheme, which I've never done this green on green thing before. Um, he had this way of in, in, inexorably entangling environment <laughs> and knowledge. And first, when I saw it, I was trying to figure out what it was. And there we go. Um, all right. So let me, can we just go to the next? Yeah, the slides are just passed me the keyboard. Yeah, yeah I'm slide. doing it on my computer. Next slide. All right. So this is just, uh, you know, for me, I've been doing this kind of work for since I was a, a law student in, in the 90s. Uh, my first job on the uh, my first job talk on the academic market was actually about uh, 
environmental inf information, which I, by, at that point was knowledge, environmental knowledge and internet comments. And so I like hit the job market saying like, there's these interesting things that if you look at it from a systems perspective, like commons is playing an important role in sort of the governance of all these different uh, knowledge resources. Well, the last 20 plus years of my life has sort of been dedicated to sort of like pursuing that same thing that I, that first paper I wrote, like, you know, I was working on uh, way back when. Um, and so the first book I wrote was this book on infrastructure um, and the infrastructure book sort of explores the idea of a bunch of different infrastructural resource systems for which commons management plays an important role and sort of develops the economic and social theory, sort of justifying sort of how we might think about uh, commons governance uh, in that context. And then sort of since, you know, sort of along around, around the same time, uh, Mike Madison, Kathy Strandberg and I started meeting and talking a lot about the idea of uh, knowledge commons and sort of adapting the IAD framework uh, and the work that Ostrom and all of you, many of you here have done, sort of think about knowledge commons, the, the, the community production and sharing of different kinds of knowledge resources. Um, and that led us, uh, you know, over, uh, uh, you know, we've been working on it ever since pretty much, uh, just a ser series of books. Um, and we're sort of, uh, along with Madeline San Filippo, who's joined us as a uh, on a bunch of these books and, and is sort of our fourth PI on an NSF grant. Uh, we sort of built a research coordination network to sort of sort of try to systematize knowledge commons research across a bunch of different disciplines. Um, and then the funny thing is that my 2018 book on reengineering humanity it, it is I did all of these things are related in my own mind. No one ever thinks of these things <laughs> as related. Um, but the reason I put this up here also is even in that book, there's a lot of attention focused on uh, sort of the role that environmental resource, both built environment resources, techno, what I call techno-social systems, um, built environment and natural environment uh, uh, contribute to form the sort of environment within which we find ourselves and shape who we are and what we're capable of doing both individually and collectively. And so the commons and non-discrimination and the role of like equal access to the kinds of resources we tend to take for granted, but we rely on daily sort of as a feature in, in, in that book as well. Um, one way to see it, you can go to the next slide real quick, Angie, and I'll go through these pretty quick real quick to get to the, the bulk of the talk. Um, so this is a, sort of the idea between, behind the, one of the ideas but in the infrastructure book is this idea that commons management, commons plays an important role in managing how different communities access and use infrastructural resources. Those infrastructural resources can be things like roads and the electricity grid, but they also happen to be things like basic research ideas uh, and environmental resources. Um, and so this kind of model and the feedback loop is something that you're going to see like that, that Todd and I are trying to explore between sort of environmental and uh, knowledge commons, sometimes environmental infrastructure and knowledge infrastructure that are both managed as commons. You can go to the next one, Angie. Um, another way to see this, and I hadn't really thought about this until I started working on this project with Todd, to be, to be honest, is it's like when I teach about the internet, and I, this is sort of my, a slide from my internet law class, when you teach about the internet, you think about the physical infrastructure of the internet. What makes it the internet is actually the knowledge commons layer that sits on top of it, right? So that the logical infrastructure of the internet, the TCP IP and domain name system um, are what make a bunch of cable networks and telecommunication systems, not just telecommunication networks and cable systems. What makes them the internet is that they are governed uh, by a set of knowledge resources that are voluntarily committed to in the form of standards and protocols for how you treat data packets you route across your networks. So what we call the internet, everything you think about as the value that is deri that derived, that we get out of the this thing we call the internet is because we have a bunch of physical infrastructure resources that are managed as a commons and those the, the, the commons layer is actually a knowledge commons layer that facilitates things on top of it. And so if you go up the stack in, about in this in this model of the internet, you think about the application at the applications layer, all the big tech platforms you think of operate at the applications layer. Some of them are infrastructural and some of them are knowledge, knowledge infrastructure that are managed as commons. And you can kind of make the same point going up. So there's sort of a, a fractal quality where you sort of zoom in on one layer and you're going to see again, sort of this sort of relationship between these infrastructure resources that shape our environments, or and sometimes you could think of them as our environments, and the role that uh, uh, commons management of those regimes has in our lives. So let me jump to our, like, the main point of our, our talk. We can go one more. So 
this is the basic idea that every knowledge, every every environmental commons will have a corresponding knowledge commons layer that that works with it. And so, what we wanted to do in the paper is to sort of explore that this insight, this this idea um, that there's sort of a dynamic feedback. Uh, re uh, dynamic sort of relationship between environmental uh, resources that we manage as commons and the knowledge uh, resources we also may manage commons as a necessary component uh, for the environmental environmental commons. I'll just interject there. So I think if there's one mis like I think everybody recognizes that knowledge has a core component of governing environmental commons. I think if there's a mistake or misconception, it's thinking of the knowledge as essentially a given input into the environmental columns, uh, commons, as opposed to like the arrows show a dynamic relationship, right? Mm -hmm. The disputes and the controversies in the environmental commons manifest themselves in disputes and, and the way the dynamics of the knowledge commons and vice versa. So each of them affects the other rather than it's sort of like knowledge is an input into environmental governance. Right, and so in a way, a good, uh, yeah, perfect, thanks. And, and so a great way to see that is there are sort of social dilemmas that give rise to in the environmental area that we confront with common with commons governance, right? Um, and they some of those dilemmas have require knowledge, information, data, tacit knowledge, shared information. But the product curation sh production sharing of those knowledge related resources themselves have their own set of social dilemmas that require governance questions. So there's a whole governance set of questions that arise to deal with the knowledge we need that, to generate and manage the, the data that or, or knowledge that we need to deal with the environmental dilemmas we're faced with. That's kind of the, the, the insight. So in a sense, the, the, there's at least three sort of sort of basic insights that come out of this that we're, we're trying to develop. One is that environment is understanding environmental commons will often require uh, understanding and engagement with the knowledge commons uh, that are associated with them. The second is that um, some of the judgments, sort of often normative judgments uh, uh, regarding the knowledge commons are sort of embedded in the environmental commons uh, that you're studying. Um, and then finally, is this point we just made that the knowledge commons present distinct social dilemmas uh, that you're gonna wanna confront that demand governance institutions. And so if you're if you're dealing with managing an environmental or natural resource and sort of how, to, how best to deal with the problems that you're confronting, you also wanna pay more increasing or more attention to the knowledge commons dilemmas that will sort of go along with it. Um, so we'll try to spell this out. And one of the points of this paper is to illustrate with an incredibly uh, basic example that everyone in this familiar in this room is familiar with. Um, just to sort of, you know, I'm not sort of uh, 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 putting Garrett Hardin on a pedestal in the charity of the commons. We could replace this store. We don't need to use sheep in a pasture. We could replace it with uh, a, a road system. We could replace it with all kinds of other congestible resources. It doesn't really matter. Um, and maybe at the end, we'll sort of, we can talk about some of those. But for purposes of sort of illustration, we wanted to start with um, the the idea that the uh, you know typical tragedy of the commons sort of story of sheep on a pasture right on a shared pasture which everyone here I, I assume is familiar with I'm going to walk you through it right the bottom lines of that the the, the takeaway from that story in terms of understanding the dilemma the social dilemma that's faced with managing uh, the the pasture. On the assumption that we're just, you know, there's a number of assumptions that go into just making it simple, um, uh, is that you've got a congestion problem and it's about congestion with homogenous use. Treat every sheep as the same, right? Uh, now, again, stylized just to make the point, right? And you face the kind of problem that's a sort of a, conge a typical congestion problem. There's a number of ways of solving that, that congestion problem, uh, whether it's pricing or whatever, but it's sort of rationing access, rationing the number of sheep that you're going to have uh, before you run into potential over, over, the, over consumption. Um, we then sort of move by sort of say, okay, let's just stick with like trying to describe the environmental problem we, we might face. Like suppose we uh, uh, have sheep and goats, right? So we complicate the story simply Assume that the only difference between sheep and goats on our shared pasture is the rate of consumption, right? It's how fast or at what rate they consume the grass or on, on the pasture, right? And you're faced with what an economist would call sort of congestion with heterogeneous use, right? And the, on, the only difference if it's the rate of consumption becomes largely an accounting problem, right? Um, how many sheep, how many goats? Uh, uh, you might think we're, okay, so that's, that's the basic kind of uh, uh, 
environmental management problem that we're facing. And so we keep going, right? The next, the next kind of problem, the point is each of these two are distinguishable kinds of problems from an environmental management standpoint you want to confront. Um, and they're simplified for, you know, for the purpose of just illustrating the differences uh, is that if you've got sheep, goats, and donkeys, right? And uh, we could choose other animals. I think in my infrastructure book originally, I used buffaloes instead of donkeys. I don't know why you convinced me to use donkeys instead of buffalo. I like, I kind of use a buffalo. But the idea, the idea with the sheep, goats, and donkeys is assume again that the, the differences in rate of consumption is one. They all consume the gas, uh, the grass, different rates of consumption, presenting the same kind of heterogeneous use sort of style problem. Um, but the one, um, the one difference we're going to highlight with is to say that goats and donkeys fight, right? It's not about how fat, how they consume the environmental resource itself. It's that when in the presence of one another, there's an inter there's something called an interaction effect, right? It doesn't have to do it doesn't have to do with uh, it doesn't matter if it's homogeneous strategy is use of the resource. It's not a congestion problem. It's that when they're when they're in the same space, they interact. You, again, if we were doing roads, we we're talking about roads. We're doing another system, right? It could be like vehicles and pedestrians. Right. It's not about how they consume the roadway. It's about how when they're in, pre in the presence of one another, they create a different kind of interaction effect an interdependence between the two types of uses. Right. This kind of problem is not can't be solved through the in, in environmental management standpoint, can't be solved through the same means by which you solve either of the prior two problems. Right. You have to it, it gives rise to the potential need to prioritize or deprioritize uh, one or other of the kinds of uses. Okay, so the the kind of solution to the just purely from an environmental uh, perspective, it's solving that kind of problem requires a different kind of institutional intervention uh, because of the nature of the problem. Um, and then the final, the fourth sort of stylized sort of extension is this idea of again sheep, goats, and cows. We're going to remove the the fighting donkeys from, just to sort of save a little bit of a you know uh, to make it simpler. Um, but they cause sediment pollution downriver. Um, we also talked about, I think in the infrastructure book, it was that they, that they fart and generate methane. And so that's a, a, a climate change problem. But the basic idea of the fourth uh, sort of stylization is just to show ex the external effects. But of course, congestion is an external effect and interaction effects are also external effects. In other words, per person making the decision doesn't account for the congestion or the person making a decision to add a sheep or a goat or a donkey. So it doesn't take into account the interaction effect, but the kind of externality effect associated with the sediment uh, pollution uh, is different because it's an impact on a third party or an outsider, someone who's not a member of the community. So that causes, from an environmental standpoint, that you, whether or not to deal with that problem at all raises a different kind of uh, uh, question, and how you deal with it will be different from an environmental standpoint. Okay, so that's my quick run through. Am I missing anything in terms of the? Yeah, just quick. Any questions about the? the it's pretty stylized. It's large to highlight. Con ra rather conventional categorization of the kind of environmental management problems one would face. Uh, okay, so next. Um, okay, so the next the next slide is sort of a, a summary of, and we're going to go through each of these real quick. Um, but uh, so so Todd and I, are, the claim is like for each of these kinds of environmental management problem. In other words, dilemmas associated with sharing an environmental resource, right? Um, uh, there's different types. Each of them give rise to corresponding but different kinds of knowledge problems. Right? At the knowledge layer, there's a common, the knowledge commons dilemmas that you'll face, the governance challenges you'll face at the knowledge layer are different from the ones you face at the environmental, but they're related. And so we're going to sort of want to try to explain uh, how, what, how that's the case. Um, and so in the paper, by the way, I should say, we go through each of the stylized scenarios and we're kind of walking through like what the knowledge related dilemmas are. And this chart just summarizes. Okay, so you can go to the next one, Angie. So the first one, which is sometimes we often sort of ignore when we're thinking about like if you teach the tragedy of the common story uh, as, a, as a starting point, you often, the ground, the sort of ground level decision, we call it like that we go zero for it, um, is whether or not you should use the land as pasture in the first place. Right, right. So the, fir the first sort of, uh, question that a community might face is whether they are, you know, what are the range of uses that to which this land can be put? Why is it a pasture as opposed to, 
uh, you know, a place where we're going to a recreational field or, or something else, right? There's a lot of many different kinds of uses. The same resource could be the, the natural resource could be put. If you call it a pasture, it already presumes that you've layered a social construction and sort of determined that it's going to be a pasture. Um, in order to make that initial choice, there's a, there's some descriptive knowledge. Oh, I should have said this in the beginning. I didn't. Um, of the kinds of knowledge that we're going to sort of talk about, there's sort of descriptive knowledge, right? Describing, just understanding the environmental resource that we're talking about and the kinds of elements it faces. There's sort of man, uh, managerial knowledge, like the kind of descriptive knowledge that's important to uh, determining and operationalizing rules and use, right? And then there's normative knowledge, knowledge about your beliefs and preferences and values that allows you to make decisions about uh, what you're going to prioritize, how you're going to prioritize. And I'll go into some of those in a minute. But I should have said that, said that in the beginning just to sort of set this up. Um, so on this first level, this first choice of what to do with the land we're potentially sharing, right? The first is this, there's descriptive knowledge. Just what is the land? What is the land we're talking about? What are the range of possible uses? What are the consequences of those uses? If we choose to use it as a pasture, as opposed to um, uh, uh, recreational fields for soccer, as opposed to something else, um, what are they? We've got to be able to talk about what those uses are effectively. Um, and we've got to sort of understand descriptively the consequences of those different choices. Um, normatively, to make such a decision about whether it ought to be a pasture or it ought to be something else, right, we've got to think about who gets to participate in making that decision, what are the criteria upon which those sorts of decisions are made, and sort of what's the process we're going to engage in to make that decision. Sometimes these things are just emergent over history. Sometimes they're more deliberative through community and collective action, right? And we're not trying to make some grand statement about it being one or the other, but in either case, as you're making decisions, these kinds of not bits and pieces of knowledge uh, are going to sort of be relevant to making that initial decision. Um, or for example, if it's emergent, you sort of land on one sort of local equilibrium in terms of your decision, you may very well want to think about whether you're gonna change uh, to a different uh, uh, use case. All right, so that's the first. If we go to the next one, uh, Angie, thank you. I guess one thing about that is like, I think that's already showing how things that if you just focus on the environmental governments, governance might seem like a given, like the, looking at it at the knowledge common reveals governance decisions that are being made on the environmental common. I think that's one of the things that's really helpful about looking at those. Yep. Yeah, always in a reference. I just ran. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> He's used to it. <laughs> We're colleagues, so he hears me ramble all the time. Uh, all right, so the second one on the, uh, so go back to the tragedy of the common story, right? And implicit in the tragedy of the common story were a bunch of knowledge sort of related issues that really don't get addressed much by Harden or any, or, or much of the literature that follows. Um, so on one hand, there's just the just sort of descriptive knowledge that you have to have, even in the incredibly highly stylized, overly simplistic scenario, right? So you've got to understand what the capacity of the pasture is. You've got to know what the numbers of sheep are and keep track of that. You've got to understand what the rate of consumption actually is in order to sort of, that may be something you learn by experience, but you're going to communicate among the herders in order to sort of figure out how to set the rates uh, of use. In order to determine rules of use and sort of operationalize them, you've got to be able to communicate effectively among members, other among the sheep herders for that to happen. So like <laughs> even in the, um, even in sort of uh, the idea, like one, you know, Ostrom and others sort of take down Harden quite easily from a game theory standpoint to say, look, sure, if it's a one-shot prisoner's dilemma in which there's no communication, uh, you're going to get defection. As soon as you relax those assumptions, right, uh, you, there's a good prospect of cooperation. But of course, the good prospect of cooperation still depends upon the payoff structure being communicable. Whether we have to be able to speak the same language and understand what we're talking about so that I understand what the contents of the payoff structure are in order for cooperation. So there's still sort of some basic descriptive knowledge and shared understandings or norms that sort of are, are working in order for that communicate, in order for that sort of outcome to sort of happen. Um, again, for normative knowledge, there's, not, there's nothing particularly new uh, in, from the normative standpoint, um, except that you still got the same question that we raised in the first scenario. So you go to the next slide. Um, if we jump up to the heterogeneous, so it's, uh, I forgot what the animals were, goats and sheep, I think it was, um, there are two different rates of consumption, but that's the only difference by assumption, right? Well, you're basically just a more complex accounting scenario. You know, the most, the real, the information primarily has to do with like the different rates of consumption, how we keep track of the numbers of animals and so on and so forth. 
Um, there can be some gaming of the system. There can be some uh, instances in which historical preferences for goats or for sheep might exist in the community because you've got some affinity or for, for cultural or other reasons, which could give rise to sort of a normative uh, challenge. But I think for the most part, uh, on the assumption that we were making, it's, you're more or less just dealing with accounting. Uh, you want to jump to the next mm -hmm. one? Um, all right. So when you get to interaction effects, uh, what's uh, things get a little more complicated, um, both in terms of, uh, so on the on the knowledge layer, right? When you're dealing with interaction effects, in other words, this is where bu not buffalo, uh, donkeys fight with sheep, right? Um, you've got to actually understand that donkeys fight with sheep. You've got to know under what conditions, when they're close together, when they're proximate, does, does it depend on, does it, does it depend on anything or is it just like upon sight they kind of rush and fight or, you know, or something <laughs> along those lines, right? So you've got to understand the nature of the conflict between those species to sort of, uh, I, I understand and deal with the uh, interdependency effects. Um, uh, similarly, you have sort of what your rules and use are and how to monitor the tracking and use of the different, use of the, uh, the the resource, both similar kinds of issues as before in terms of the descriptive knowledge. And then the, the normative knowledge is actually kind of interesting with interaction effects because interaction effects aren't solved through just uh, rationing or queuing um, uh, or licensing. Um, instead, you actually have to deal with the fact that there is this kind of conflict among uses. And so that often leads to a need for uh, prioritization. Right? You might say, like, we've got to ban one or the other, or we've got to reduce the number of donkeys um, so that you don't have the, the fighting. Uh -huh. Right? As soon as you introduce the idea that you're going to prioritize one over the, one use type over another use type, right, that's a different kind of normative uh -huh. question that the community has to confront. And the way in which the community, community will confront that issue is going to obviously going to vary based on the kind of problem we're having, um, but it's different in kind from the kind of knowledge problems that up until this up until this particular scenario we've had to do. Um, and again, sometimes it's going to be deliberate, but sometimes it's like, well, we've always had this as a sheep pasture. So as soon as Brett brings his donkeys in, then we know Brett's wrong and we're right. Uh, so we may deliberate about it, or we, we may just have a common understanding of what this is in a way that makes the priority decision. Right, right. So it, but again, the, the looking at analyzing a case study in which interactions are affected, are present and that if that's what happens the knowledge okay, the knowledge commons perspective it helps to look at it through this angle because then you identify that that that's what's happening as opposed to some kind of deliberate decision uh, that's been collected from data. okay well, let's jump i've got five minutes okay uh, right. so uh, again uh, i'll just say productive use externalities like you've got both descriptive and normative knowledge like components like things you've got to figure out in order to do with the thing but the big one i think that's really interesting that gets highlighted by looking at this from a knowledge commons perspective is the uh, is the sort of the decision about whether or not you care about outsiders like do, does our community care about the external effects we cause on people downriver mm -hmm. the community that you know uh, uh, another uh, community that's temporally or geographically uh, distinct from our own. Um, and that's constitutive of the community itself. What kind of community you are and want to be is determined by those kinds of decisions. Um, those kinds of decisions may be shaped by internet, you know, inter-community or international uh, or, or legal relation, like what your relationship is. But the whole point is that these kinds of um, external effects cause you to confront those kinds of normal questions. And, that, and the knowledge commons within which you confront those questions is going to be a distinct kind of governance uh, uh, arena than you, the, the kind that we've been discussing for, in the prior examples. Okay. All right, so we can jump to the next one. So lots, we think there are lots of applications, right? So we think that this, uh, if any of this is making sense, if any, any of this is new, um, we think it potentially is useful for adapting and integrating some of our research frameworks, like the IED, SES, and GKC. Um, uh, some of the design, Ostrom's design principles, uh, as we say in the paper, um, often implicitly assume that there's a knowledge component, there's like a knowledge component just implicitly assumed to exist. Um, and the idea that there might be governance dilemmas associated with generating and sharing that knowledge is sort of not addressed. We think sort of that might help us you know, sort of extend the Ostrom principles or, or complement them with knowledge commons related principles. Um, it's also relevant for knowledge common design. So I'll, I'll put that aside. Um, 
we'd love to consider lots of different environmental commons case studies, old and new, and see where the knowledge commons layers fits in and what the dilemmas are, what the look like. Um, and then we're also kind of interested, in, to be honest, in the built environment context, because I think there's tons of uh, both examples and case studies that would be worth exploring. So now I'm going to sort of uh, uh, sort of shift the focus, the shift the gears and and hand the mic uh, to Todd because we've got a series of examples that that Good. are from the environmental area that are quite we think are might be useful places to start applying there. Can we just talk about we have like no time. Yeah, go for it. Why don't we do one and then okay. we can keep on. Yeah. So this is just a basic idea of sort of like a very common in the environmental and natural resources arena would be some sort of public lands that are designated for multiple uses, right? So a national forest area where there are constituencies that want to uh, take timber harvested off that land. People want to hike on it. People want to bird watch on it, um, a variety of things. And so the environmental commons is the forest. The knowledge commons is what do we know about that forest that's implicit in the, all the management decisions that we're thinking of making? How do we think about this as a forest? Um, are we just thinking of it as a bunch of timber, right? Some people are. Are we thinking of it as a place to hike? What do we know about the interactions? And our point is that the decisions about how to use the forest rely on a whole bunch of stuff that comes out of the knowledge commons, right? Um, and so our understanding of what is this forest even used for, there may be uses that people aren't even aware of and therefore don't get normative priority because people just don't even know that people are gathering mushrooms in the forest or something like that. But if you only think of it as like the knowledge commons is feeding into the environmental commons, you're missing that the knowledge that we have about the forest is in significant part going to be driven by the incentives that people have to produce knowledge and share that knowledge, right? So you see this quite explicitly when it's a formalized process like that the Forest Service is going through as the timber industry will go out and generate knowledge about what it thinks the effects and the benefits are of timber harvesting and other stakeholder groups would be wise to do so uh, themselves. And so, um, that interactiveness is is um, and there's lots and lots that we could talk about this, but maybe we should open it up to let questions. Me, let me get make you do the other one other example that we talked through that I think would be great. Um, um, I think I'm there. It's the Clean Water Act. Is that the one where there's the uh, yeah the disincentive. disincentive? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so just go one more to the to the uh, Clean Water Act. Go go back up. I mean, yeah. this one, there's a couple of examples, but this one I actually think is really interesting too. In this audience, I think it might. So think of the problem of water quality of like a stream or river that has a certain amount of water quality that we think might be a problem. Um, so there's the environmental commons, which is the water quality of the of the stream. And then there's the knowledge commons, which is everything we know about the water quality of that stream, including contributors to water quality problems. So the Clean Water Act creates a mechanism by which states say, this is how clean we want our stream, this river to be. And then the state is supposed to list all the waters in the state that do not meet their water quality standard, this is called the impaired waters lists. So this is clearly in the governance of the, the environmental commons governance realm, right? If you have waters that are more polluted than you think they should be, you need to take certain regulatory actions in order to improve water quality. A dynamic that exists in the real world is, though, is that, well, how do you know if your waters are impaired? Well, if you have data indicating that the water quality is below your goal. Gathering data takes money. Should you spend money to find out you have a problem that you have to fix? Or do you just not gather the data, right? If you gather the data, you might get required under the statute to regulate. So there's this incentive in the knowledge commons to just not gather the data, because if you don't have the data showing there's a water quality problem, then you don't have these regulatory mandates. And so it's an interesting way in which the environmental governance feeds very directly into the knowledge commons, which goes back into environmental governance. And the solution may very well be to be to build a more effective knowledge commons, where like crowdsourcing of collection of mm -hmm. uh, water quality data. For example, right. Right. this shows the problem with having the environmental government basically also be the knowledge government, right? If if one per, if one entity is in charge of both, that creates more of a circular effect. Whereas if you disaggregate it and let other people feed into the knowledge commons, uh, and we can talk about more about how you might do that effectively, that can change the environmental governance as a result. 
Okay. Yep. So you should open it up. I'm going to stop the screen share and we'll open it up to questions. And I know Greg's going to go first. Well, <laughs> great framework. Uh, I'm excited to think it through. Although in that particular instance, that would be anticipated by the IAD framework, right? That the principle of monitoring is not just that you should collect data, but that the monitors should be you know, uh, accountable to the uh, people whose interests are at stake. And so in this instance, the, the state is actually distanced from the impact of polluted water. And so the state is not a reliable monitor, um, potentially, of, of the quality of, of the environmental commons. Um, and so, so in this particular instance, yeah, it seems like the classic IAD framework anticipates that problem and, and includes a, or how to address it. Do you see other ways in which uh, you know, the IAD framework needs to be, you know, that, that monitoring principle in its classic form is just like not sufficient and you need to further shake out like, you know, other knowledge commons dilemmas that would be missed um, in the classical framework. I don't know if I'm using the classical framework. Sure. That's, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and you've, you've framed it perfectly. Um, yeah. So no, we're, I don't think it's that the, uh, that, Either the GKC or the IAD framework are that were that are necessarily uh, deficient across all cases. I think that they they are incredibly useful. Um, and the idea that the uh, that there there would be accountability uh, by the uh, there be a, the monitoring and accountability include those who are affected by the yeah. by the resource um, is a good is a good one and it has implicit it's sort of maybe it's less implicit, it's more of one of the few that are explicitly uh, focused on some of the potential knowledge dilemmas. Um, I think even, even in that case, I'm not sure it's a sufficient principle for all right. cases. I, su I suspect that if we look carefully at the best way to generate information about uh, even environment, even just classic environmental natural resource commons, that that, that principle may not always be enough. Like there may be additional knowledge commons dilemmas associated with generating trustworthy information about quality, environmental quality um, that just including the, uh, those who are affected in the process or making them account, like what it means to make them accountable may actually- That's what I was thinking is it, more into. is it maybe that focusing on the knowledge, knowledge commons helps you put meat on the bones of the idea of accountability, right? It might help you understand what effective accountability means by taking into account the knowledge commons aspect of it. Jamie? Jamie's up here. Nope. Hi there. <laughs> Hello from my apartment in Bloomington. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm not in person. I picked up something on campus, but um, yeah, no, I love your work. There's so much um, nuance and thought about various types of governance systems that I really appreciate. Um, so, and you're right, um, Eleanor oftentimes only alludes to, you know, I ideas of value. It's really Vincent's work that talks a lot about the uni union of fact and value. So if, if you're going to talk about things in, you, then you, in the Ostrom context, then you kind of have to talk about Vincent's work as well. And so like his natural fact and artifact, oh, excuse, yeah, no, I'm sorry, his um, artisans, uh, artifact, sorry, artisanship and artifact article from 1980 is a great starting point um, because he talks about how people work in organizations and how they bring their own values to that organization. And so I think that's a lot of what's going on here um, or in, in your work. Um, it's just the context isn't public. It is kind of public public administration with the environmental policy stuff added as well. But everything about the union of of you know the the governance and the values is there in Vincent's work. That's super helpful. So we we wrote I mean, Todd wrote it. I didn't write that. You wrote it down, right? Uh, that's super helpful. Thank you very much, Jamie. Because we know that people have thought we're we don't think that we're the first people to thought about right. thought about this. What we want to know is what have people already done? How can we build on that? And so it's super helpful to be reminded of stuff that's already out there. Yep. So I'll give you an ex a better a water example. So in, I, 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 water. I spend the summer in, <laughs> I spend the summer in Minnesota, <laughs> and lake associations in Minnesota collect water quality data, and then they band together and they have coalition of lake associations at the county level. There are 21 counties that have the, have the data collection. My county, the data is over 30 years. And my county is bisected by the southern part of the county is agricultural, the northern part of the county is forested, and the water quality is going downhill, and you know where it's going down. <laughs> and it's improving in the other one. 
and it has caused said the knowledge now and and the, the dnr which provides it says well we won't do any reporting until you got 10 years of data well they just put our report out for 30 years of data and the agriculture community is in a hell of a jam so mm -hmm. it, it, the perfect mm -hmm. is to be yeah. thank you so much brian online okay um interesting paper interesting stuff and i guess um at the end, you kind of ask what else to talk about. And I think these simple examples are useful for introducing things, but maybe also link it to some of the big things like um, climate change. So in that context, if you'd say a little bit about how you approach questions of both uncertainty and learning, and then contested knowledge, and, and you know all the different kinds of contestation from self-interested actors, but again, also in climate of figuring out how many tipping points we've run past or what may be coming along and you know how to deal with surprises that make us you know revisit our expectations thank you well so brian i hope you're coming later today to the uh, ipcc as knowledge commons uh <laughs> presentation maybe not but i don't mike madison's on he's not on so mike madison has a paper oh is he on there's mike i see his yeah um is Mike will be presenting a, a a paper on the IPCC as a as Knowledge Commons uh, later today, right. um, which picks up and in part sort of applies some of the some of these ideas. I think you're right to say that the uh, thinking about learning, shaping beliefs and preferences, how to develop cons scientific consensus around and, and many other things around climate change are fundamentally Knowledge Commons dilemmas uh, for which. Governance, like how how we govern the production, sharing, curating, and distribution of that knowledge is is key. Um, so we we don't it, like Todd and I haven't fully mapped it out. It was one of our slides as sort of a as an example we think is worth exploring with this this framework uh, or for with this or through this lens. Um, but yeah, I think the the all of the points you made are things that we think you know the surface in a knowledge commons from a knowledge commons perspective as useful things that demand their own sets of governance institutions. So thinking about the IPCC that way is, is I think a very useful one. I think one of the most interesting things there that I've thought about is so on the one so the IPCC is like this supposed to be this big broad process of you know thousands of scientists of so on the one hand, it wants to have a maximum credibility, right? It doesn't want people to be able to say, well, that's just what the IPC says, but you know, a lot of other people think differently. So that might lead you to be very consensus-based and be reluctant to make a, a strong recommendation. On the other hand, you have a problem with a really long tail that um, taking the average or even being conservative is unlikely to yield to effective action. So you're balancing sort of like the effectiveness of the action that you're going to take with the credibility that's necessary to take action, but the decisions that the IPCC makes are going to have direct ramifications for how we, what if any actions we take on the environmental commons. And so it's like what seems initially like, well, these are scientists deciding what they put in their report is actually very much a decision of like, what are we going to do about the climate? Um, right. Uh, so you, you could think the IPCC is exclusively doing science. It's all descriptive. It's all descriptive knowledge. But of course, it's not. It's descriptive, it's managerial, and it's normative. Like all the three kinds of knowledge that we're highlighting are relevant that create their own sets of dilemmas from a knowledge commons perspective are all present and, you know, incredibly important in the context of the IPCC. Oh, yeah. yeah there, one, one more thing that just pops into mind is... Um, in the environmental law and policy, we talk a lot or think a lot about whether the scientific criteria for statistical significance is appropriate to be used as a management trigger in managing an environmental resource, right? Like, so if someone wants to say this chemical causes cancer and the scientific literature is saying, well, not until you show at statistical significant level, is, should we automatically import that into the environmental governance or should we be having a different criteria? If we have a different criteria, then we're going to need knowledge that uses that criteria to be to feeding into that. So, but it's something that like we actually, it turns out that that statistical significance, which is really a knowledge commons issue, has tremendous management implications and consequences that we haven't really dealt with. Deanna's next. 
Hey guys. Um, I remember when I used to do environmental law. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a long time ago now. Uh, the, I want to go back to the question of um, do we need a new framework to capture this? Um, so, and this is, uh, I, I admit my bias, uh, and it's a it's really a hobby horse I'm riding on. Almost every new article I read on analytical frameworks says the IAD isn't good enough for this, and so we're offering a new framework. Almost every paper. So now we have this proliferation of dozens, if not hundreds, of frameworks, new frameworks being proffered every, every year. Um, if you think about understanding this in an IAD or combined IAD SES context, what are the community attributes? Well, there may be multiple communities that have to be, whose attributes have to be described, including epistemic communities, right? The, the scientific community that's studying these problems, that's giving, providing the knowledge basis uh, uh, for, for, for the regulations. Um, obviously, as you suggested, the idea of regulatory conflicts of interest isn't particularly uh, novel, although I like the way you describe it in the context of state water quality uh, regulation. Uh, but then again, there's, there's a end run around that because the Clean Water Act requires polluters to collect evidence against themselves and publish it publicly, it makes citizen yeah. suits a lot easier. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Than they would otherwise be. So that's a, at least partly a solution to that problem. So I, I, I guess I just want to um, provide a, at least a caution because it, it does in a way devalue um, the IED framework, when everybody's claiming that it can't do X, where it actually can, if you think it through. Well, I guess enough. But my understanding is we're not so much challenged. Like to me, it's like so. Say that say that you're right that the ID framework is is great. Does it add anything? I think our claim is not so much about that as there's an IAD framework nested within an IAD framework, right? Like you have to think distinctively, or well, it's a, it's, I think you have to, it helps to think distinctively about these issues and right. maybe IAD and knowledge and IAD and environmental so this, problems. This goes to Mike's, uh, Mike McGinnis, who's just left the room, uh, his work on adjacent action situations, right? Maybe knowledge collection is one of the, or actually multiple number of adjacent action situations to the regulatory action situation, which itself is decomposes into multiple action situations involving agency collection of information, a, agency uh, in, invitations to environmental groups and to industrial groups for regulatory negotiations, right? And each of those uh, efforts is a separate kind of uh, let's say operational level action situation. So just like we consider um, finance provision and production to be different, but adjacent action situations to any kind of, you know, uh, collect, uh, collective level action, uh, 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 problem, so we can say, and, and I think this is where you can make where yours is a real contribution. Uh, and and really, I think from from Vincent's point of view, would be something he'd be super in, for, in, uh, in favor of is is to say um, we often miss in our IAD applications uh, the epistemic level or the epistemic action situations. So I, I, my basic answer is like, I, as far as I'm concerned, the the uh, we're not abandoning IAD, and I don't think for the for framing of the action arenas involving environmental resources, we would use the IAD um, or SES, I suppose. But I think we lean towards IAD for reasons. I suggest of you combine them. I know. <laughs> but but I I would 
I would continue to use the GKC framework to study the knowledge commons mm -hmm. dilemmas because the for reasons we've explained multiple times in multiple books. So I think we could go into it, but I think there's significant differences in the in the resource systems and how they work and the institutions and the feedback effects and all that stuff uh, that distinguish the way. But it's very you know the GKC firm is basically the IED framework, but just adjusted in ways that capture the differences between knowledge. Uh, resources and in environment and in physical or natural resources, but it's quite close. So I don't think it's a huge no, no, jump away. Not, so what I would do is I would I, we're not offering a separate discussion. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't add a new framework. I would I don't think we're adding a new framework. We're doing we are doing the adjacent action situation thing. That's what we're doing. But we're trying to just closely couple the uh, environmental and the knowledge, and then sort of talk about what the flows are like. Perfect. So so it's sort of they're kind of closely linked in that way. Gustavo? Okay, I think I have two comments. So the first one is probably related to dance. It's like, so one suggestion to make your case even stronger, no? It's consider examples in which for managing the uh, resource, the environmental common, you want to do A, B, and C, but that will completely destroy your incentive to collect information, properly use information. So essentially give a clear examples in which uh, those things enter into conflict, no? Yeah. Because let me consider one possible scenario that in terms of establishing incentive, they are perfectly aligned. So I don't care. I can be analyzing the commons knowledge or the resource commons. And essentially from the point of view of the final uh, um, rules that I need to manage, I, I don't care which one I am analyzing, no? It's only interesting when you start having clashes, no? So be more open and specific and put more emphasis in those clashes because the, the, the juicy things are there, no? The, the second thing, it's more about scope. It's to what extent do you really need a common resource? So every organization faces these type of problems from a household to a corporation to states. So essentially that those problems associated to governing commons a kind of part of the problem or pretty much any organization. So my question related to that would be, what is specific uh, about the underlying resource is a commons versus the underlying resource is not a common? I could give you a slide. The, so for me, the difference between a commons and not a commons is not about the resource. Okay. So commons aren't resources, right? Commons are the institutional governance of resources. So it's, it's the institutional arrangement by which communities share resources. Okay. What those resources are vary. They can be environmental resources, they can be knowledge resources, they can be other built environment resources, they can be all kinds of things. And you do find, so, you know, firms do manage some resources as commons, meaning there's institutional, institutionalized mechanisms for sharing resources within a firm. And sometimes they're knowledge resources, sometimes they're just a break room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So the, the point about, I this is how I see it. I know I understand some people will say, no, 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 commons is the resource. And I've, I've resisted that for 25 years and everything I've written, but it's not. Like, as far as I see it, like, the, and that's why I think that there's an advantage to the approach that Todd and I are taking is we're saying the kinds of resources that a community shares gives rise to different kinds of social demand dilemmas that give rise to social demand for institutions, and that's where you see commons arise. Like commons are the set of institutions that communities rely on so they can effectively share resources to serve some shared goals or objectives. Um, sometimes those institutions are rooted in property law. Sometimes those institutions are rooted in social norms practiced on the ground. Sometimes those institutions are rooted in some other mechanism, um, but, so I don't know if that helps answer the question, but so that that's why for me it's not. Uh, I agree with you. You see, you see these kinds of uh, environmental and knowledge commons in all kinds of different organizations. Does it matter how how is how is ma so the governing of the resource matters for the uh, dynamic between the governance of the of commons and of, of the of the associated knowledge common. I think it does it doesn't matter. So you, you can we can be talking about the resource that is perfectly managed as let's say private property, and still there is an associated 
common and those interactions are still relevant, no? I think so. I'm thinking of like, take a garden, right? So there is, you are right in the sense that to have a nice garden, even if it's like your garden that you privately own, there's a knowledge that you need to have. And there's normative decisions and descriptive decisions about like zucchini are going to get right. Like there is knowledge and there is an environmental resource. But I think the management issues for those, for the, both the knowledge and the environmental resource are very different than if it's a community garden, right? So if it's a community garden, it's not one person deciding, do I like zucchini versus, you know, um, tomatoes? It's the community has to come up with, it's just going to be a different dynamic. So I think there's always knowledge that is required for managing an environmental resource. But the issues that arise are going to be very different when it's an environmental commons, because then it be, almost by definition, I think, becomes a knowledge commons, which is going to have its own issues that are distinct from just knowledge. Are there clashes between, so do you have any examples of clashes between managing the resource and and the, and the, and the rules that you need for law? So, and then yeah, so, so you could have, I mean, I just offered that we have one or two in the paper just in the stylized discussion, but just there could be uh, strategic behavior, opportunistic behavior between sheep herders and goat herders. Mm -hmm. I can misrepresent the uh, the rate of consumption that my sheep have imposed uh, in part because I want to, I know that you've got goats, right? And so there, there definitely can be conflicts uh, within participant, you know, stakeholder groups within the, within the uh, community. Um, depending on what the what the environmental resource is, um, that gives rise to a knowledge dilemma where you've got to sort of manage whether or not people are being honest or what kind of information they share about how their use impacts others. Coming back to that, that wouldn't be even monitoring issues in the standard framework. Yeah, and we can talk about it more during the lunch break. I don't know. Did you, do you think we have time for Jamie to get that? Uh, I had already reached out to Jamie and told her I didn't think okay. we'd have time, but cool. that's yeah. cool. And John, I will pass on your question and be sure everyone sees it so they can respond to that as well. Mm -hmm. But we are out of time. And so thank you very, very much. Thank you all very much. Lunch and stuff. And I'm going to leave this open if you want to keep slides up. Or John, 